Buenos días. Good afternoon. My name is Elena Dominguez. I have a job here at the Spanish National Research Council. I am the Vice President for International Affairs. I have three reasons to ask for your attention just a couple of minutes. The first one, and the main one, is a few days ago, my boss, Rosa Menendez, the President of the House, was suggesting, Elena, would you enjoy being the master of ceremony of the debate gender innovation? Uh, oh, yes, Rosa, thank you very much. Great, so happy. This is an honor. Thank you, Rosa. I mean, the fifth debate, after all, here I am. Good. And then I went to my office just to, I said, oh my God, gender innovation and Professor Londa. I know why she was suggesting me to be the master of the ceremony, just to pronounce your family name, Londa, the first one. Okay, we'll see how can I avoid this. We have been training, nevertheless. The second reason, the second reason is that we have slightly changed the dynamics for this debate. I mean, we having the opportunity of uh, listening to our lecturer, Prof Professor Londa Schivenger, we decided to give her the floor for as long as she wishes. We don't need anyone else because the subject is her subject, or better said, she is the subject. She is gender innovation. So we don't have any other speakers, we don't have anyone else, but we will keep the round table. And the round table is open to all of you. So the audience, as usual, you are not only invited, but you are really, really requested to write down your questions in any language, the one you choose, the one you enjoy, and then, after the lecture of Professor Londa Sivinger, then we will pose, we will pose these questions. Only one, one thing, if I don't manage to translate properly the question, I will go for the next one, and this question, it will not be clear, okay? Just not to make sure that I translate the question properly. And then the, the third reason for me being here is, is useless. It's useless because you all know our Minister of Science, Innovation and Universities, Pedro Duque. And you also know Professor Rosa Menéndez, the President of the House, the President of the Spanish National Research Council. So they are the ones that they will address the word to you as well. So it's time right now, Rosa, for you to do your job and to take the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Uh, very good. Yeah. Thank you. It's a problem with the computer. If you can hear, it's okay, better now. Minister of Science, Innovation and Universities, General Secretary, General Director, Vice President, uh, colleagues and friends. Today, we celebrate the fifth meeting of the debates Science and Future at the Spanish National Research Council headquarters. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all again to the last of these debates for this year. In early March, and in light with our 80th anniversary, I propose these debates as an opportunity to establish a dialogue between society and scientists. We have discussed about the grand challenges that science, as the key instrument to build up a knowledge-based society, is facing in the short, medium and long-term scenario. This first debate opened the door to discuss the engagement of science with the Agenda 2030 and particularly with the 17th Sustainable Development Goals or 
better said, how science contributes to peace and prosperity for people and to sustainability for the planet now and into the future. All along these debates, we have largely discussed about artificial intelligence, and we also did in two sessions. The first one, to envisage the scope and dimension of artificial intelligence, and then to overview artificial intelligence for good. This gave us the opportunity to review the impact of it on health, on decent work, and economic growth, and on education, just to mention a few of the covered examples. My expectations for this debate have been completely fulfilled. I had no doubt on the scientific relevance of these sessions because we have invited excellent researchers from the overall Spanish science and innovation ecosystem, from research organizations, universities, private companies, as well as from political bodies. I publicly acknowledge their contributions and efforts to share their busy agendas with all of us. But if I say that my expectations have been fulfilled, it's mainly because of the very active participation of all of you, following the sessions directly and also by streaming with a very active participation. Your challenging and brave uh, questions have deeply enriched the overall discussion. I wish to highlight here the active participation of young students with genuine and imaginative questions that anticipates a good perspective for the future. All of you have been and remain an essential component for the success of this debate. Among the immense and possible subjects to continue, we have carefully chosen today's subject, gender innovations. There are several ways to approach gender equality in research. 17 years ago, in 2002, the SIC, the Spanish National Research Council, established a commission directly reporting and providing advice to the president of the institution for increasing women's participation. The so-called Women and Science Commission, and since then, we have accurate uh, statistics about the presence and leadership of female scientists at the SIC. Consequently, we have deployed serious efforts to increase women's participation in science and technology with acceptable uh, results all over these years, so we still find areas for improvement. We are also very seriously engaged with the promotion of gender equality in the professional career of the SIC. And more recently, we grant a yearly award for that institute or center offering the very best measures and plans with this purpose. However, we have not truly discussed how to overcome gender bias by mainstreaming gender analysis into basic and applied research. Research has documented that uh, methods, techniques, and epistemologies of Western science are not value neutral with respect to gender and other social inequalities. This is why and the reason for today's debate. 
Once chosen the subject, the choice of the scientist covering the subject was straightforward. Professor Londar Schivenger from Stanford University. I wish to thank you, Londa, for your willingness to come to Madrid and to lead this debate at our organization at CSIC. No need to say how proud and happy we are that you could make it today. Ladies and gentlemen, these debates reinforce the compromise of uh, CSIC with the society and thus I anticipate that they will continue next year. Uh, we have learned through the previous ones that we cannot diminish our efforts to communicate to the society the value and impact of research and innovation. I have no doubt that today's session will be a breakthrough for stimulating excellence in science and technology by exploring or overviewing the integration of sex and gender analysis into research. And overall, by doing so, we will greatly contribute to a better and more inclusive society. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Uh, just mentioning the Commission Women and Science, and because the delegate from the President is here, Pilar Sancho, I just want to mention specifically the immense work and efforts that she has deployed and she has been doing for all these years since 2002. Now is the time for you, Minister. What an honor to not to introduce you. Everybody knows you. So please, uh, Minister. Our Minister Pedro Duque will present uh, our speaker, Professor Londa Schiebenger. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Uh, good morning, President uh, of the Spanish National Research Council and uh, all the other uh, senior officials, ladies and gentlemen. This thing with the computer. Okay. Ha. It's a great pleasure to be here today to introduce uh, Professor Londa Schibingar, one of the world's leading authorities on gender and science. I know you have all come to hear her, so I'll be very brief. Our speaker today received uh, her doctorate from Harvard University and is currently a professor of history of science at Stanford University. Holds the John H. John L. Hines professorship. She's an elected member of the American Acad Academy of Arts and Sciences and holds doctor honorary doctorates from several universities, including the University of Valencia which was conferred in her last year. She has take, taken part, well, conferred in her last year, yes, that's one of the universities in which we are proud to have a, a rector who is a woman too. She has taken part in various United Nations initiatives and participated in important co collaborations with the European Commission and the United States National Science Foundation. She's now the project director of Gendered Innovations, which studies how sex and gender influence science, health and medicine, engineering and the environment. <laughs> Professor Schibinger's work is extensive and varied. She has published six books and 90 articles and has taken part in innumerable courses, conferences, workshops, seminars, movies, exhibits and interviews. I can just imagine the thickness of the CV when she tries to receive. <laughs> She has received 18 awards and led uh, 29 research projects. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing Professor Schibinger's lecture today. One of the key priorities of uh, Spain's Ministry of Science, Innovation and Universities is to implement policies that foster equality between men and women. If we fail to leverage all the talent we have, we won't be able to reach the goal that we have set for ourselves. To make Spain, again, as it was centuries ago, a country of knowledge and innovation. 
I was uh, talking to uh, Professor Schiebinger just for a few seconds uh, earlier, and I was telling her that we have already delivered uh, some of these uh, ideas in uh, changes in law that we have made in the in this same year in march we changed uh, uh, some uh, precepts some some lines of the law so that we uh, uh, put as a condition for every uh, every um, competitive uh, every competitive let's say award or application that we make in the in spain uh, to take into account the gender, uh, to make, uh, to put measures in order to, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, compensate the gender differences. And we have already, th this uh, same week or the week after, we are going to, pro to uh, publish the first of, of such, uh, of such, uh, Condition, different conditions in applications uh, for women to be able to have uh, uh, a longer time to do the same work during the times that uh, that they are having uh, children. And immediately she asked me the the million dollar question, like, and then what do you do? Do you allow men to also receive those? those? So I'm sure I'm, I'm sure that uh, that she will uh, tell us very intelligent words about how to solve these million dollar questions today. Today, Professor Schivinger will explain how gender analysis allows us to do better science and how it increases the quality and quantity of scientific, technological, and social innovation. It is impressive to read the evidence that Dr. Dr. Schivinger has gathered. Her analysis provides accurate evidence that in significant ways question a large part of the research carried, up, carried out up until now. I won't hold you up any longer. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Londa Schibinger. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just get, I'm from California, so let me get my technology going. Here we go. So today we will explore gendered innovations. Gendered innovations, whoops, there is this little problem over here. <laughs> gendered innovations was produced through a large international collaboration involving the European Commission, the US National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. We've now expanded into South Korea. In Seoul, there's an entire center for gendered innovations research and technology, a research center. We've expanded into South Africa and Japan with recent forays into Brazil and Argentina. Gendered Innovations has brought together more than 200 basic scientists and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops. New policies have been implemented in the European Commission, in Canada, in uh, the United States, and I'll, if I have time, I'll discuss these later. Now, um, your President of CSIC said I could speak as long as I wanted to. I intend to speak, I could speak for two or three days. So, but I intend to speak for about 45 minutes and I now have my watch out. So um, then I'd be very happy to hear your questions. Innovations, so today we're going to talk about gendered innovations. An innovation is about integrating gender analysis into the design of research at the very beginning of the research. The operative question is how can we harness the creative power of sex and gender analysis for discovery? Does considering gender add a valuable dimension to research? Does it take research in new directions? Now historically, governments and universities in the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality. The first I like to call fix the numbers of women and focuses on gender equality in, in uh, increasing the numbers of women in participating in science and engineering. 
I think you do that a lot here. The second is Fix the Institutions, which promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research organizations. And the third I call Fix the Knowledge, or Gendered Innovations, which stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex and gender analysis into research. And today I'm going to focus on number three, completely on fixing the knowledge. And I think um, you were saying, Dr. M M Mendoza, <laughs> that you were saying you have a competition or uh, something in your universities in, here at the council for increasing the number of women, but I want you to do one for fixing the knowledge as well. So next time I come to Madrid, I'll expect a report on that. <laughs> so let's dive in. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were with recently withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects. And eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We can't afford to get the research wrong. But doing research right can save lives and money. An analysis of the US Women's Health Initiative hormone therapy trial, which was a large government trial done in the US in the 1990s, found that for every dollar spent on research, $140 were returned to the taxpayer in healthcare savings. And the study also saved lives. There were fewer cardiovascular events, fewer heart attacks. There were fewer breast cancers. And there were more uh, quality adjusted life years. So while most of the results were positive, you see the, uh, the stuff on osteoporosis here, uh, there were more osteoporotic fractures. So I'm very interested in these kinds of metrics. Somehow, if you can put a dollar sign on it, it means more. So um, if any of you have these kinds of metrics for other research, I would really like to see how adding gender to the research not only enhances discovery in human science and innovation, but does it help us economically. So it's crucially important to get the research right from the very beginning, and this is the goal of gendered innovations. This project does two basic things. We develop state-of-the-arts methods of sex and gender analysis, and we provide case studies uh, of concrete examples of how sex and gender analysis leads to discovery and innovation. And I will now discuss some of these examples with you. <clears throat> but first, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Surely, it's, 19, it's 2019. I don't need to ask you if you know the difference between sex and gender, but I suppose I will anyway. Um, so sex is about biological aspects. If you look here, am I getting a, oh, I don't have a pointer. Anyway, so the bottom part is the sex differences here, genes and sex hormones, any biological characteristics of the human body um, or animal bodies. Uh, gender is the social aspects, the social attitudes and behaviors. And this very nice illustration is from uh, Vera Regetsugrosik in Berlin. She's a cardiologist. So she's interested in the differences, gender differences in nutrition, in lifestyle. But it could be education. It could be ethnic differences, any of those things. And her point is that these things interact over the course of the lifetime to give you your health outcomes as an adult or to make you who you are as an adult. So sex is about biology and gender is about culture. Now lots of us think about gender in binary terms. We think of male and female, man and woman, but we have to recognize that there's intersex, which is ambiguous uh, sex, often ambiguous genitalia, which is a certain portion of the population. Um, but when we look at gender, we're moving very quickly beyond just men and women. A 2016 poll in the United States showed that 0.6% of the population, or nearly 2 million people, identified on transgender. 
as transgender. They were willing to say on a survey that they identified as transgender. And we have now this estimate for gender fluid. It's many, many more people, people who don't feel they're exactly a man or a woman, but the uh, certain fluidity in relationship to gender. And then we know that some 15 countries allow a third sex category on legal documents. That is to say on birth certificates, on passports, that sort of thing. I don't think Spain is on the list. The US isn't on the list. Some of our states allow a third category on driver's licenses. But some countries, you'll be a little bit surprised. I was surprised to see Germany, India, and Australia. So there are 15 countries that I know of. OK, back to the science. Now, let's go back to why 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market. There are many reasons why drugs fail, and fail more often for women. And one reason is that research is done more often in males, whether in humans, animals, or cells and tissues. This study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley. And it shows the sex of the lab animals used in research. These are mice or rats. And you can see the blue indicates that mostly the animals used were males. Then the red is the females. But what I'm interested in is the gray area over on that side where the sex of the animal is not even recorded. If we don't record the sex of the animal, this is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window. You can't use any of this data in future meta-analysis. So it's very important that we use both male and female mice and rats in research and that we also record and analyze that data. A similar study was done also in 2011 on cells and tissues. And here you only see gray area. The sex of the cell is almost never identified. And again, this is failed research. So you're saying, OK, that's 2011. What about now? Uh, this is the most recent data I have. Uh, this is from neuroscience. And here, the blue part is when sex is considered as a biological variable. And you see that it's just flatlined <laughs> across. There's been no change in how we analyze sex and gender. Now, we would expect in 2016 that there will be an uptick. Our National Institutes of Health in 2016 require that all research that is public funded that is to say, if you're funded by the US government, you must consider sex as a biological variable. So I would expect to see an uptick next time we get a chart like this. Now I want to give you some examples of how sex and gender analysis enhances the quality of science and engineering. I'm going to cover biomedicine, then some artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, and then some robots. Believe me, the robots are coming, and the question is, should we gender them? Hmm. So our first example, first we start with cells and tissues. So our first example comes from stem cell research. And now I'm going to go live to our website, which I hope will be up here as well. OK, now how do I, is there a technical person? How do I get the other screen to show here? We're on the wrong screen. I don't know how to switch the screens here. <laughs> so I'm going to need both screens, but I need them both to project. I'm going to be going back and forth from the website to the PowerPoint. So you might have to have, oh yeah, OK. That should do it. Very good. Thank you. OK, this is our web website live. And anybody can use this. It's a public website. We build it to work as fast in India as it does at Stanford. So I hope that um, you will use it and learn lots about it from it. So here we have all of our methods 
loaded up. You can see them. I'm not going to talk about them today, but we have our case studies in buckets of science, health and medicine, engineering, and environment. So you can go to any one of these examples and look at them. So right now, I'm going to talk about stem cells in basic science. And we start here. So why might the sex of the cell be relevant? I've told you that you need to use both male and female cells. So why might the sex be relevant? Research shows that sex, there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. This slide here shows, and it's taken from muscle tissue, shows that female stem cells are just more active and regenerative than male stem cells. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell, which may lead to failed research. An international team from Norway and Australia worked with stem cells in mice. They appropriately used male and female mice, but when it came to the stem cells, they used all female stem cells, and this was an unconscious and arbitrary decision. It means that in the discovery phase, they did not see anything unique to the male stem cell, nor did they detect important differences in function between the male and the female cells. The result of not considering the sex of the stem cell was that their male mice died, and they didn't know why. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake. When in doubt, blame the postdoc. But eventually, through a gendered innovation workshop in Norway, the team realized that they needed to also consider the sex of the stem cell. And they found that for their experiment, that sex matching was the important thing. They found that matching male to male and female to female gave the best results. But of course, you have to look at all combinations of donor and recipient interaction before you can rule anything else out. But of course, it's not that easy. We have a method that is called analyzing factors intersecting with sex. And in this case of the stem cell, these factors might include the type of the cell, the disease being treated, and other variables, whether hormonal, immunological, or environmental. Now let me just interject here. So this was about animals and stem cells. But we also uh, transplant organs into human beings. I hope you never need a heart transplant. But if you do, you better look at the science. Which is better for you? Is it to match sex, to not match sex? Which gives you the best outcome when you're getting an organ transplant? So we know from the science that for hearts, you should do sex matching. Gives you the best outcome. Um, I think lungs follow the same patterns, but kidneys don't. So whenever should you ever need such, um, such a treatment, you should look at the science. Now, even if the surgeon knows the best science having to do with the sex of the organs, there's also a gender problem. And that is that in the United States anyway, I don't know if it's different here in Spain, women offer more organs for transplant. So even though a surgeon might know, say you're a man and you need a heart transplant, the surgeon might know the best science of the sex but may not have the organ available because of the gender politics in society. Okay. Now, it's not enough to look at sex and gender in a static way. Oh, good, we're all set now. We have to look at the interaction uh, between the sexes. The following example highlights why it's important to look at this interaction between uh, the different sexes. So Anne Bernays' lab at Stanford studies aging. So I'm going to talk now about these little C. elegans, which are little, you know, nematodes. I think of them as little worms, but I don't think they're quite that. So they wanted to know how an individual's longevity is affected by the opposite sex. And here's what they found. 
In the, in the nematode C. elegans, the presence of males accelerated the aging of the individuals of opposite sex, in this case, hermaphrodites. In other words, the hermaphrodites died at a younger age in the presence of a male, and they called this male-induced demise. So in animal research, male and females are often studied separately. So in labs, they often cage the, animals sep the males separately and the females separately. But in the wild, opposite sexes uh, coexist, and this can influence their longevity. So what kills these unsuspecting hermaphrodites? It's the pheromones released by the males. So they don't, the, the, they don't even have to have sex with the males. If the males were in the petri dish, if they were in the medium in which the, the hermaphrodite is now present, this can kill the poor hermaphrodites. So the researchers suggest that this may be the result of an evolutionary process. In any case, for the unsuspecting hermaphrodites, whether they're fertile or sterile, males are bad news. Now my second example of these kinds of interactions looks at animal research in the laboratory and reveals the interaction of the animal in the lab and the sex of the researcher. An important study by Sorg et al. discusses the impact of the experimenter sex. The example focuses on pain research. Researchers induce pain in rats and mice. They're studying pain. And what they found is amazing. They found that the rats and the mice don't show their pain if a man is in the room. Now think about this. This is basic. You all probably take pain tablets, right? The basic research has been done mostly by men who have historically been the scientists, and the animals won't show their pain to a male research. It's very scientific. They have grimace charts. They have every ways of measuring how the animal is showing pain. So um, the animals don't show their pain if a man is in the room. They show their pain if a woman is in the room. Then, so then the researchers got really interested in this. Well, what about, OK, let's put a student in the room. Does that matter? OK, it matters if it's a man or a woman student. They did a cardboard cutout. OK, that didn't matter. They put a chair in the room. What was it about something in the room? So it was a man in the room. That was the difference. They identify this as the male observer effect. So what's going on? It's not how the researchers act or how they handle the animals. What is it? Again, the animals smell the men. They smell the male pheromones. And according to Jeff Mogul, whose lab this, uh, whose lab this came out of, this phenomenon throws into, research, into question all prior results from pain research. OK, so a lot to consider. We see that it's extremely important to study uh, sex as a biological variable across the lifespan in all its complexity. And biomedical, it's so important that The Lancet, which is perhaps the leading medical journal um, uh, in Western science, put into effect in December 2016 these guidelines for articles that they would accept. If you want to publish an article in Lancet, you have to use the term sex and gender correctly. Okay, we already went over that today, so you could get that right. You have to report the sex or gender of the study participant, so you have to do these things or the article is not excellent and it may not be published in their journal. Now, most biomedical journals now have such guidelines, um, but I haven't found any engineering or computer science journals with such guidelines. So there's more to be done, but this is extremely important. Now, uh, I've done how the sexes interact, and now I want to do how sex and gender interact. This is very important. And I'm going to continue with my pain example. Pain is interesting in humans because pain has both biological aspects, there are sex differences in how we feel pain, men and women feel pain differently, and there are cultural differences. There are gender differences in how people report pain and how physicians understand and treat pain in patients. So let's look first at the sex differences. 
And I recommend to you this three-page paper uh, by Amber Dance, wh which was in Nature. It's a popular paper, so it's easy to read, and it's extremely informative. So the story is shown here. Uh, this is about the sex differences in pain research. And it, does this work on here? Yeah, OK. So uh, the, uh, oops, researchers want to know how, how sex differences work in the brain, so the male and female brain. So in the male, well, let's say the, the root of pain, the pain root through the human body was described in this way uh, here on this side. And the big story is the microglia. This is really what, what indicates how you feel the pain in your body. And the re researchers thought, great, let's publish that. And then they thought, oh, maybe we better look at the females before we publish. So when they looked at the females, they saw that the story is not at all about microglia. The story is about T cell cells. So this means that how sex is processed in the human body is quite different and differs by males and females. But again, it's not that easy. What I was fascinated by is the fact that males, let's see if I can get my lip, that males who are lacking testosterone, that means maybe older men, they switch over to the female pathway later in life. So they switch over here to the female pathway. And some females, especially women who are pregnant, switch over to the male pathway. So it depends not only on sex, but on age, it depends on hormonal comp complement, it depends on many, many things. So to get the research right is, I'm sorry, it's very complicated. We need to really train our researchers in how to look at all these aspects. So that's the issue of sex differences in the human body having to do with pain. And now let's switch over to gender differences because, of course, this gets even more complicated. Pain also has cultural aspects, gender uh, factors into how people report their pain and how physicians understand and treat pain. What treatment a patient receives depends on the patient's gender and on the physician's gender assumptions. So you have a lot of things going on here. You have a patient. The patient can be a man or a woman or a gender diverse person. That patient is going to see a physician who can be a man or a woman or a gender diverse physician. And that physician is going to offer a treatment. And all of the treatment is going to depend on the interaction between these two people, the patient and the physician, and the gender assumptions. <clears throat> so first of all, <clears throat> Um, there, there are gender differences in how people report pain. Gender stereotypes in many cultures expect men to be strong and resolute, which means that men may be less willing to express their pain than women are. So this, of course, can vary by ethnicity and other social factors. So physicians then have gender assumptions. They may think oh, men don't express their pain, so if a man says he's in pain, I better take that more seriously. Me, uh, physicians have many assumptions about uh, what influences pain, so clinicians often perceive women's pain as psychological, and consequently, women receive more nonspecific diagnoses, they can wait longer for treatment, they receive more antidepressants instead of pain relievers. And then, of course, as I said, ethnicity can also complicate the, pic the picture. Stereotypes regarding race um, in the US, uh, has we did a study, and US physicians reportedly believe that African Americans don't feel pain as acutely as white people. And consequently, when African Americans come to emergency rooms in the United States, they're 40 times less often likely to get pain medicine than white Americans. So we have all of these gender and race assumptions which influence not only how we express pain, but how the physician will treat pain. OK, now I'm finished talking about medicine, for those of you who thought that was a bit much. 
And I'm going to go on to um, AI and specifically look at machine learning. <clears throat> and I start uh, with a little story here, which is on the website. And now I'm going to go to engineering, where we have all of our um, artificial intelligence examples loaded up, and I'm going to talk about machine translation. Oh, I'll go to the full case study. Okay, and now I start with a story. And my story starts in Madrid. <laughs> in 2012, I was in Madrid, and there were some newspaper articles written about me. And I don't read Spanish, sadly. I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish or read Spanish. So when I got home, I zoomed the newspaper articles through Google Translate to see what you all had said about me. And I was shocked. I was repeatedly referred to as he. Londa Schiebinger, he said, he wrote, and occasionally it thought. This was not the problem of the newspaper article, but of Google Translate. Google Translate has a mail default. Now, how can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to the masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the internet, on the World Wide Web, than she said. So if you look at Ngrams, if you use Ngrams, which is another Google product, uh, turns out you can't live a moment of your day without using a Google product, um, we find that the ratio of he said to she said was four to one in 1900 and peaked in 1998 at the ratio of four to one and then dropped dramatically to two to one in 2010. So this is the reason that Google Translate got it wrong because it sees it in the data. It gets a higher score if it identifies me as a male, so just like my Stanford students, the machine wants a higher score. Um, but the problem is that that is no longer the case. When we had this um, change in language, this drop from f four to one to two to one across from 1968 to 2010, this was a huge cultural change. We had the women's movement, uh, even our presidents use inclusive language, he and she. It was a big cultural event, this change in language, but with one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of revolution in language, and they didn't mean to. It was completely unconscious gender bias. So the fix, a few years after that, uh, we had a workshop, and we at Gendered Innovations invited Google and some other natural language processing professors from Stanford. They listened for about 20 minutes, they got it, and they said, we can fix that. So fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women is not the best road forward. I had to ask myself, how is it that the Google engineers, many of whom are educated at Stanford, made such a simple mistake? How is it that they got out of my university without knowing the basics of gender analysis? Well, for one thing, we don't teach gender stuff in the engineering school. Sure, you can come over to history and take all kinds of great courses from me and my colleagues, but we don't teach anything about gender and other social issues in the engineering curriculum where these students live. So this is one thing that we're trying to fix now. We're trying to get basic elements of social ethics into engineering and computer science courses. So again, some products can be fixed, but what if Apple, Google, and other companies started product development research by incorporating gender analysis? What innovative new technologies, software, and systems could be conceived? So the point I want to make here is that this unconscious gender bias from the past, from the data, amplifies gender inequalities in the future. When a translation program defaults to he said, it again increases the frequency of the masculine pronoun on the web. So when I, who am a woman who thinks and writes, am defaulted to a man, it increases our stereotype that it's men who think and write and not women. So it's a big deal when the machine gets it wrong. 
And it turns out that even though Google wanted to fix the problem, they haven't been able to. It's often harder to fix something once the basic platform is set. So importantly, Google Translate is creating the future of our technology. And as we know, our technology, our devices, our programs and processes shape human attitudes, behavior, and culture. So in other words, these past, this past bias is perpetuated into the future even when governments, universities, and companies themselves have implemented policies to foster equality. So the big question becomes, how can we humans intervene in these automated processes, in these algorithms, to create the kind of society that we want? Now, since we did the Google Translate um, example, there are many like examples that we see in AI and in uh, machine learning. And I'll just give you a couple more. They're very interesting. So if you go into Google search and you're looking for a high paying job, uh, in the US this is defined as about 120,000 or more. The fact is that men are five times more likely than women to be offered ads for high paying executive jobs. So why is there this bias in the algorithm? Again, it's the problem of the data. The data shows very clearly that men earn more in a society than women do overall. In the US, it's about, uh, women earn about 80 cents on the male dollar. So the machine, again, is trying to get it right. It wants to deliver the ad, the right ad to the right person. That's what Google search does. And so it's going to send an ad for high paying jobs to more men than to women. Another example having to do with um, computer vision. <clears throat> I call this the two bride problem. So here we see the image of two brides. So this is computer vision. When you search for images, um, if you search for the image of a nurse, if you search for an image of a flower, if you search for an image of anything, it's computer vision that is controlling that. So these are the images of two brides, one from North America and one from North India. So a photograph of a traditional US bride dressed in white is correctly labeled bride, dress, woman, wedding in the computer vision programs. And therefore, if you search for the word bride, you will get this North American one here dressed in white. But the photograph of the North Indian bride is labeled performance art, red, and costume. So if you're someone living in India and you search for bride, you're not going, you're going to get the North American bride returned to you and not the bride from your culture. So we see that there is a bias again in the data, this time a bias having to do with geographic location. So the reason that there is this problem has to do with ImageNet. Again, it's the data that is biased. More than 45% ImageNet is the uh, huge database. It's 14 million labeled images. It is what makes the, the programs work for computer vision. So more than 45% um, of the ImageNet data comes from the, from the United States. But we in the United States are only 4% of the world population. So whenever you're searching for images, you're getting US results for those images, not world results. So by contrast, China and India contribute only 3% to this database, to uh, ImageNet, but they are 36% of the world population. So we need data sets with appropriate geodiversity. That's the point of this. OK, and one final example of artificial intelligence has to do with biomedical applications. So recent applications of deep learning have been successful diagnosing skin cancer. The algorithms are very good at predicting, are as good at predicting skin cancers as physicians are. So the idea is that you will have an app on your phone, and if you have a spot on your skin that you think might be a skin cancer, you can diagnose it immediately with this app. And these apps are really quite good at that. But the problem comes again 
that the database is dominated by white people, by European Americans, and contains very few uh, images of people with darker skin. So it is true that people with darker skin suffer fewer skin cancers, but still it's important to include them in the diagnosis. So it's currently unknown whether this app which can diagnose skin cancer works on black people or not. So very important that we get the research right. Now, Gendered Innovations doesn't just um, identify bias, but we try to offer solutions. And I'm not going to go through some of these solutions for machine learning because they're a little bit complicated, but there are very interesting ones. One is counterfactual analysis, and one is multi-accuracy auditing. Um, and there are things you can do to correct the algorithm so that you get the results you want. For us, it's results which improve gender equality. So um, all of this stuff on AI that I've been talking about, you can find in one of two Nature papers. One was uh, done in July, um, and the other just came out. Um, and you can see a summary, or you can look at our case study on machine learning on the Gendered Innovation site. Now, I promised you some robots, so let's get on to the robots. Robots are very Im uh, important. Ah. So we held a workshop in 2018 in March. I was on sabbatical and I had these interesting wor workshops. And we wanted to know about the gendering of robots. Why do people feel the need to gender robots? Are there specific domains where a woman's voice would be ideal for a nursing robot? And a man's voice might be considered ideal for a math tutoring robot. Then we wanted to know about, well, what in fact genders a robot. So this is very important because the robots are coming. As our population ages, we won't have enough human beings to take care of elderly people. And it is thought that assistive technologies, one of which will be robots, can be very helpful in this regard. Um, and another way that these assistive technologies are used are for like autistic children, for uh, helping education in that area. Robots are designed in a world alive with gender norms, gender identities, and gender relations. Humans, whether as designers or users, tend to gender machines because in human culture, gender remains a primary social category. And are there benefits to tapping into the power of social stereotypes by building gender into robots? For example, if you are building a, a nursing robot, does it make sense to make that a female robot? because people, humans, expect nurses to be female. We know that in the United States, 90% of the nurses are female. So if you meet the person's expectation, if you meet the person's stereotype, does this mean that the person, the human who is being treated, would be more likely to take their medicine? Would they be more likely to do the exercise the robot is telling them to do? Should we gender robots according to social stereotypes, or should we not? But there's a danger here. As soon as users assign a gender to machine, we reinforce the stereotypes. Similar to what I discussed in machine learning, the danger is that gendering robots will reinforce gender inequalities by embodying current stereotypes. So if we come back to the nursing example, if now I gender all the robot nurses female, am I meaning, am I closing off nursing as a good job for men? Nursing in the United States is now really quite a good job, and more than 10% of men would like to be nurses. So if we reinforce this stereotype again and build it into our hardware, into the robots, are we closing off this career pathway to men? So what we did in our workshop, we wanted engineers, we had a bunch of engineers there, roboticists, we wanted them to understand how gender becomes embodied in robots, and we wanted them to think about designing robots to promote social equality. So what genders a robot? This is Pepper. 
Um, have you seen pepper anywhere? Pepper's often in malls. Pepper's around. Yeah, so how would you, how do you read pepper? Culturally, how do you read this robot? Do you think it's a male? Do you think it's a female? How do you read it? It's Japanese, so it might be a little hard to read. <laughs> so anyway, the way that we can gender robots is by color. If you wanted to gender this female, you could put anything pink on her, and suddenly she would be female, right? Another thing that um, genders the robot is the voice. Now, voices are full of cultural information, of course. And the pitch indicates whether it's male, female, or a child. And lower voices in our culture carry more authority. Some of you may know that Margaret Thatcher, who was the first prime minister in England, was coached at their national theater to lower her voice so that she got more authority. So voices carry a lot of um, cultural information. Um, in the United States, you can identify what part of the country people are from, from a voice, all kinds of things. Now, Pepper's voice is not female, like so many of them. It's a child's voice. Childish voices are non-threatening and very often used in technology for the elderly so that no one feels threatened, that they seem friendly. And I want to say that the Danes, so in Denmark, engineers have developed a gender neutral voice, neither male nor female. It's called Q. I would play it for you, but I don't think we have enough time. So the voice. Now the name, Pepper. Is that a male or a female name for you in Spanish? For us, it's a very neutral name, right? Pepper. The only Pepper I know was Gwyneth Paltrow in one of the Iron, uh, is it Iron Man shows. But otherwise, Pepper isn't a name for us, really. So that's good. That's kind of neutral and non-gender. Now, another thing that uh, genders something is the anatomy. And how do you read this anatomy? I think it's extremely confusing. You have this very cinched waist, this very narrow waist, makes you think, oh, it could be female because then that makes the hips gigantic. But then it's like the legs are a dress. Um, so it's, it's a very hard thing to read. I have to say, in traditional Japanese society, men wear dresses, right? I mean, they have these long flowing skirts, so it could be a Japanese thing that indicates it's male, but we don't know. Now, personality or character is another thing that really uh, genders something. And I don't know what Pepper's personality is. I haven't really studied it. But let's take Siri. I think all of you are probably familiar with Siri, which is on the iPhone. She was designed to be slightly sassy and demure. And I have to say that all of these virtual assistants, like Alexa or Cortana and Siri, are all female, right? And this is a real problem. Um, when we have virtual assistants who are female, and there's not one of the, now you can choose a male voice for Siri, but that's a choice you have to make. It comes default female. Um, we reinforce the idea that women are assistants and that they are always available to help you out. And the other problem with Siri is that Siri is highly harassed. Apple records everything you say to Siri. You should be aware of that. Um, and Siri is sexually harassed. Siri is also given many proposals for marriage, but she is highly harassed. Now, recognizing this, this came into the press a couple of years ago. And recognizing this, the um, companies that make these things like Apple and Amazon have changed the responses. So Siri, you, so when Siri was asked, uh, what are you wearing? These are one of the things that people ask Siri, Siri, what are you wearing? And she used to say, well, um, why would I be wearing anything? <laughs> but now she says, I'm not going to respond to that. So this is a way that the companies have tried to be responsible. They do not want to antagonize their users. They don't want to lose you as a customer. So Siri does not defend herself very strongly. 
but she will deflect the question um, and try to, um, you know, try to make it better. Okay, so the point of this is that technology shapes society and society shapes technology. So what we want to say is that culture is full of gender norms. Gender norms are those rules that we all live by. We know what they are. They're often not spoken, but we have gender norms. Um, and engineers have the opportunity. Can I get my little pointer here? Engineers, I'm not, here we are. Engineers have the opportunity to challenge unequal gender norms. They can build technologies. They can build algorithms and robots that promote gender equality. This would encourage users to rethink gender norms, and in this way, we can reform society. So I would like us to have a virtuous circle of technology development and not a vicious circle, which in fact um, encourages inequalities. So if you like this kind of research and if you want updates, you can sign up for uh, the Gendered Innovations newsletter. Only I send emails and I'm pretty busy, so I send them about once a month um, and you can do that. Okay, now I just want to finish up very quickly by looking at policy. Policy, of course our website is about research, but policy is one of the drivers of research. So uh, we want to talk about the reinforcing infrastructure of science, and that is what granting agencies do at the beginning of research, what your policies are. Do you accept research proposals if they look at sex and gender? So for policy, we have to include sex and gender, and then peer-reviewed journals at the end. And what we've done here, you can look at it when you have time, we've loaded up all of the um, major granting agencies and given you their policies here, which you can click on um, and you can see. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there so that we have some time for questions. Thank you, Londa, for this uh, excellent overview. Uh, I'm going to take the, the, just a second to apologize because the minister has a commitment right now, so mm. he's going to leave the room. So you don't have any chance. I don't know if you want to, to, to raise any question to our speaker or uh, just, um, or just uh, you are leaving now. So, uh, no, but okay, Minister, now is my revenge, okay? You didn't write it, sorry. No, no way. Because I have so many written questions here that, Minister, I'm afraid, uh, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for coming to join us in this debate. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Londa. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this excellent overview. I mean, most of, I mean, there are some scientists here, most of us who are scientists, and if we thought that to perform science was difficult, now we know that it's almost impossible. Because... <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't the message. Okay, that's right. Right, good, good point. And this is the issue. This is the issue because the, there is another narrative for this, because now we know how to do it better, how to do it excellent, because we know the conditions, we know the parameters, and we, have, we know some of the considerations. Many questions from the audience, and uh, I'm going to take, so still, if uh, now that the minister is left, we, we have more time. So if you allow us, Londa... Uh, one of the questions says, um, is dealing with about education. Uh, where and how can we address these topics in educa on education at all levels? It seems that this is a rather complex message and how to translate this into education programs. And I will add as well, this is my privilege, how to introduce these messages as well into the society because then we will get back the feedback most likely. Please. Yeah, so, um, I don't know, this seems to have turned off. Um, so I was, I have been thinking of opening a curriculum portal, portal on the Gendered Innovations website. It is very important that we incorporate sex and gender analysis in basic science, in the medical curriculum, and in the engineering curriculum. 
I don't know uh, what you have here in Spain. I mean, I know some of your gender researchers, so I know that you have very active gender research, but I don't know if you teach sex and gender analysis in core courses that all students have to take in engineering um, or in basic science. This is something that is very important to do so that they can't get out of a university and not know something about it. Sure, they might need to study more in graduate school, but they should at least get um, some grounding in this. Um, so I guess it could be in, I don't do second, I don't do elementary and secondary education, um, so I don't know how it could be uh, done in the school system, but yes, I think that would be important too, make people, uh, you know, give them the basic information. Um, and then you asked how to bring it to the larger society? Yeah. Well, that, um, so I was interviewed by your television network this morning. I mean, you just have to get it into the media. Uh, people need to publish articles and then do popular versions of them. We did this nature paper that came out last week, um, and I've now been asked to do a blog, a more popular blog on that article. So we need to, we can work on social media. I think there are lots of ways that we can uh, call this to people's attention. I know in the United States it's been the public that has put a lot of pressure on companies like Apple and Google. So it is a cycle, and the public, as consumers, can say, we want responsible technology. So you can vote with your pocketbook as well and bring a certain um, pressure to companies. You can talk to your um, representatives in government. Um, lots of things that people can do. OK. Um, a couple of questions, because I think that some of the uh, some people in the audience they were curious about this um, uh, fluid gender, and uh, two questions. I mean, one question about this fluid gender straight is what is the definition of fluid, for fluid gender, and uh, if any, or uh, it, uh, I mean, what is the difference with fluid gender people if there is any difference? Uh, so fluid gender is something. I'm sure. I'm sure that the terminology is not uh, is not equivalent in Spain. But we have fluid gender in Spain. This I'm telling you. And um, then another question in related to this, most likely to say, uh, basic. I mean, what about these innovations? Mainly performing basic research in disciplines where the object of research has no gender. Yeah. Okay. So first, uh, gender fluidity. So there are many, many words that people use now. So, so gender has been binary, man, woman, masculine, feminine. And I, I, my first book was on how those ideas were created in the 18th century. They were part of Enlightenment Europe, and they're very deeply embedded in democratic systems. So I don't have another hour to give you a lecture on that. but. Uh, so binary gender is not natural. So we can have lots of different flavors of gender. We can have lots of different gender identities. And I think it's good for societies to break out of these boxes. I'm not even using the words masculine and feminine anymore because they're boxes that people are pushed into. You know, a boy can't cry or a girl can't do X, Y, or Z. These are boxes of our own making. They're cultural artifacts. It's not true about human beings. So I think that there's been a great cultural movement to make gender more fluid. There are many, many words that are used. Uh, there's agender, meaning you prefer not to have any gender at all. There's gender diverse, meaning that you're just different from other genders. There's, I um, can't even think of them all now, um, but there are many, many words. Uh, there's, um, there's so many words for it now, and I've been working with some sociologists because we'd like to do a survey and find out how people identify, but we don't even know which words to use on the survey to, to get the information from people. So we also have a blank box so you can write in <laughs> what you think your word is. So I think it's, it's very good for us to, um, it moves the society on to equality. If we don't have 
these very strong ideas about what is right for a man to do and what is right for a woman to do. So I think we should be able to do what we as human beings want to do, what we think we're good at. Um, so that's the, what was the second question? Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I'm done. With yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. The second question. Sorry, I, it was I'm, not I'm very a related. little bit busy with the next one. Oh, yeah. Uh, what about research? I mean, basic research. Oh, research. Where but, oh, when the subject is okay. So you got particle physics. Okay, particles don't have any sex or gender, right? So um, for sex and gender isn't relevant to mathematics. Mathematics is a set of skills and techniques. <laughs> Um, doesn't have anything to do with sex or gender. It's like having a hammer. A hammer, <laughs> well, a hammer might be gendered because they're made a certain, they, you know, they're made to fit the male hand. So it's possible that the tools of mathematics are gendered. Maybe they were made to fit something, I don't know. But anyway, um, I don't think we should strain to find gender where it's not that relevant, like for the stars. The stars aren't really gendered. So when you get to these areas where the subject matter is not sexed or gendered, you can ask a question about the priorities of scientific research. That might have something to do with gender politics in society. Why do we want to know about this and not know about that? So we know that there's been a lot of preference for male topics in science and engineering, and many of the female topics have not been so looked at. That was a very binary statement. I ought to revise that. But anyway, um, we should look at the places where sex and gender are really important, and we should work on those first. OK, so in, in line, I mean, with this question, I mean, because there are so they are coming, uh, there were other questions asking, do you know any case in which gender bias has affected the results on mathematical research? I mean, this is, I think that the question has been already answered. And let's put this in the other way around. I mean, there is one student, because we have here all levels of education. We have scientists, we have full professors, we have tenures, we have non-scientists, and we have also secondary, secondary school students. And many of them, they are posing questions, and one of them is saying, I'm not, I'm not mentioning names, hope you don't mind, do you think that the gender obsess of the researcher influences in the investigation or in the method? Say it again. The, do, the you, do you think that sex the sex or gender, I mean, this is literal, literal the sex or of the gender the of the scientist is influencing on the result or on the method of the, of the result? I mean, to yeah. achieve the method right. to achieve. So I gave you one example of that, right? The sex of the researcher in the lab uh, actually influenced the animal response. That's, you know, I would, that, that's rare. I do think that the gender of the researcher influences what they research. So if I take something, this, isn't, this is humanity, it's not science, but if you take the field of history, the field I study, when I went to graduate school 30 years ago, it was about wars and politicians and um, you know these kinds of things. That was what defined history. But since that time, since I went to graduate school, lots of women have become historians. And we have opened up many, many new questions in this discipline. We now have the, well, we created gender history. We created women's history. We created history of the family. It wasn't thought that the family was important enough to study because wars were important, not the family. So uh, I think since women have come into that discipline, you can see that we now define history as something different than it was defined before. So you could do a similar study of other disciplines and see what the impact of new people coming in asking new questions would be. I believe that this is quite, uh, I mean, this is something remarkable and it was not in our conscience because there are many questions in that, I mean, in, in, on this, I mean, on this issue and just asking for further examples, but so I, I, I will avoid them because just to avoid repetition. Let's go to a question. There are some also uh, politically tricky and, and I don't know, I mean, if the, I mean, my boss will complain me to, for saying this. We will see. The minister is gone, so. Um, related to children's toys, do you know any study on the positive effects of neutral sex dolls and puppets? 
neutral sex dolls and puppets. So um, Mattel, the maker of Barbie, just came out with a gender neutral doll, right? Is that what you're talking about? So yeah. Somebody knows about this new doll? Um, so as I read about this new doll, you can change its gender. They give you different pieces of hair you can put on it. So you can put on long hair, and then it has one. I, I mean, I, I thought their whole idea of what changed your gender was a little strange. But um, nonetheless, there are some gender neutral dolls. Yeah, toys have been very gendered. Uh, the toy stores in the US used to have a pink aisle with all the girls' toys and a blue aisle with all the boys' toys. So you would find all the engineering things over in the boys' toys and all the dolls and the girls' toys. So they've taken that away. They're now just toys. They're not marked for boys or girls. Um, and there, there's this very famous um, engineering toy uh, that was designed for girls by a Stanford graduate. I forget the name of it now, but she made, so you, you build with this toy, but she also realized that girls prefer stories, and so the whole building process came in a story. So that you were, she was trying to, I'm sure lots of boys like stories too, she was trying to make engineering appropriate for a different kind of person, right? Um, and, and so I think it's very important what our toys are and how we, how we um, mark them. Okay, and um, what about, um, what do you think? I believe they, uh, they are, someone is asking your opinion, we are all asking your opinion about to leave sex blind in the mm. CV just to improve that uh, women we get at least the first interview. Sex blind is not always so good. Sex blind usually means completely sexist, right? If you're sex blind, it means you haven't thought about it. So you want to be conscious, you want to be gender conscious, and then you want to choose the right thing. You want to choose equality. So um, I think that we need to be very conscious of these things. If we're, I don't know what, what this person means by sex blind exactly. Uh, there is the famous example of the orchestra uh, in Vienna that had never had a first chair violinist that, who was a woman. And they did these blind auditions, so they put up a screen so that the conductor couldn't see if it was a man or a woman playing. And then uh, they realized that more women were getting the position in the orchestra because you couldn't tell immediately from the sex. However, there was a second part to that, and that's that when the applicant walked out to play, you could hear whether they were high heels or uh, flat-soled shoes on the stage. And so there, there had to be another adjustment. So we couldn't hear what the gender was. We couldn't see the gender. We couldn't hear the gender. Um, so, but I, I don't, usually when you say gender blind, it means you haven't thought about it yet. So we want to be very conscious about these things. And we, I think we should be able to know what the gender is and then be fair, right? I don't think it should just be the, oh, we don't know who this is and let's be fair. I think we should be able to consider gender and still be fair. Uh, there is also because, I mean, here at the, well, here in Europe, at the European Research Council, they, I mean, it's, it's, a, de, it's, uh, it's a fact that there are more uh, starting, consolidated, advanced grantees <laughs> male than female. And then they did an exercise, and the exercise was, OK, we don't show the name, uh, um, in gen I mean, particularly the gender of the applicant. And then they realized, the conclusion was, that there were some divergences, that there were some differences with uh, qualifying the proposal with the name, female or male, and not qualifying the proposal with no name. And that was in favor of female applicants. So this is also the question why we have, I mean, we are, I mean, we are rather uh, sensitive about this issue of, I mean, when submitting proposals, if the name should be there. I mean, the typical example, I mean, a very brave, courageous proposal is generally 
ascribed to a man, and this is good. But if a female is applying something very, I mean, flagship, very, I mean, advanced, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then the, this is, I mean, the, the, the perception is just a negative perception. So that's, that the question is also in that direction. Yeah, so I haven't kept up. You're now you're on level two, fixing the institutions. I have not kept up with the research in that area because I'm focused on level three, fixing the knowledge. So um, I haven't really, I don't think I have a good opinion. You probably know better than I do. Um, so okay, um, I'm, the, I'm so. interested in the research. Fine. So this is, I mean, this is a question I, I don't know if you, mi if you mind, but this is not fixing the knowledge, but fixing more, I mean, more better the, the, the num I mean, fixing the institution. Are there policies for encouraging women participation in top science being implemented in the U.S. universities and institutions? Are there programs to yeah. increase the number of women? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, Good. Tons of programs. And again, I haven't kept up with them, but we very often, um, if we... Uh, we need especially African-American uh, scientists in the U.S. We have very few of them. Um, and so we often identify really good candidates in graduate school. At Stanford, we'll track them and then see if we can help them along and eventually hire them. So there are many, there are so many programs to fix the institutions. Okay, yes, um, there are some questions very focused on biology. I don't know if, uh, I mean, uh, what do you think is the key? Genetics or epigenetics of uh, the different gender sex character? Well, okay, genetics or epigenetics. What is the main issue here? <laughs> okay, the well, as I tried to show with Vera Rigetsugorosik's slide, there is an interaction between biology and culture. And we can see that culture actually changes biology, and we also obviously know that biology influences culture. So it's not either or, it's, it's both. Well, I guess, uh, should technology shape society or society shape technology? Well, did you not see my last slide? <laughs> <laughs> Good. We want to make a virtuous circle of that, right? We want, obviously, we humans make technology. So we, yes, we shape technology. But what we want is to make responsible technology. So we want that to be a virtuous circle. Okay, now very, I mean, I'm sure that this is rather young opinion because uh, how could Google solve the problem with Google Translate and grammatical gender? Should it include, suggest, alternative to gendered pronouns like CE, C, SER, SERS, or use, I mean, fluid gender for the grammatics, I guess, or use they, them instead? Mm -hmm. Should it offer both options? Uh, well, I think it would be very easy uh, for Google Translate to default to they. So they has entered the U.S. dictionary, the Webster, the Merriam-Webster dictionary. So the, the last question, I mean, this is going to be the last one. Uh, thank you, Londa. Um, how can how we approach this, uh, this subject in countries like, I mean, Islamic countries, how to Saudi Arabia, for instance, that, uh, that the culture, religion is completely different? How could you approach this when you, conf you are confronted with religion? Yeah, so um, I recently spoke in Brazil at the Global uh, Research Council uh, where we met and talked, um, and Saudi Arabia was there, and they had a very positive response to my lecture as well. So in many instances, science is more international. Yes, it's influenced by society, but we also have international norms, standards, and regulations for science. So I think that, um, that we can still insist that gender be considered when we're like publishing things in Nature or in the science magazine or things like that. So I think we can still look at it. We have to remember that gender norms are different in every society, but still they impact science and technology in every society. Okay, and this is uh, 
Thank you, Londa. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time, for mm -hmm. your wonderful overview. And thank you to all of you.